Uh, my name is Matthew Deluri. I'm an uh, emergency medicine physician uh, with Wheaton Franciscan Healthcare and Emergency Medicine Specialist working in Milwaukee and uh, Waukesha County. Uh, today's lecture is going to be about the GI tract as well as the GU and reproductive tract. Uh, we're going to spend quite a bit of time on the pathology uh, of, the, uh, of those particular uh, uh, tracts. Um, that's going to be towards the end. Uh, the first part of this is going to be a review of the anatomy uh, and physiology, uh, both the macro and micro uh, parts of the anatomy. Uh, we'll get right into it. The GI system, I think we're all very familiar with. Uh, it's uh, for the digestion of food, and then you absorb your uh, water and your nutrients. Uh, it's also part of the detoxifying system. We'll talk quite about that uh, when we talk about the liver uh, as well as the GI role. Um, with it. Uh, any disturbance certainly in the GI system not only affects that particular system but can affect the body's homeostasis uh, in its entirety uh, with it. Uh, grossly, uh, I think we're quite familiar with the GI system. It makes a lot of intuitive sense uh, to paramedics. They've dealt with it quite a bit. Uh, all we have to envision is what happens when you eat and when you swallow, starting with the uh, oral cavity going down into the pharynx, the esophagus, into the stomach, small intestine, large intestine, and the rectum. Uh, the important take-home point, and it'll be emphasized several times, is that the GI system is not only the physical areas that the food touches, uh, but also all the different organs that contribute uh, to this homeostasis, like the liver, the gallbladder, uh, the saliva producing uh, glands with it, and that's uh, very important to remember when you consider the GI system uh, as a whole and different areas that can go wrong with it that critical care paramedics need to be uh, familiar with. Uh, in particular, some of these accessory organs like the salivary glands, we don't necessarily think of when we think of the GI system, but certainly uh, they're immediately uh, needed to produce different uh, sorts of enzymes and buffers in order to aid in the initial secretion uh, from your uh, mouth on down. Moving now to more of the micro uh, components of the GI system, when we look at the walls of these tracts, they're actually uh, divided into four different layers, the mucosa, submucosa, the muscularis externa, and the serosa. Uh, those four layers are moving from what the food touches all the way to the outside, and uh, the books tend to emphasize these four layers and find them uh, to be very important that the, the paramedics are familiar uh, with these four different layers. As we start on the inside with the mucosal uh, layer, we have a lot of the plaque in here, the, the lumina propretia in there. This is where a lot of the smooth muscle uh, lives um, within the GI tract uh, with it. As we move out to the submucosa and the muscularis uh, areas with it, we see a little bit more of the glands uh, being produced. The uh, blood vessels are in there. And this is where we get a lot of the parasympathetic nervous system uh, in these outer layers. And so as you could see, as you move into these uh, deeper layers uh, of it, we start to see uh, more of the neuromuscular uh, areas. And then on the very end, the part uh, that's furthest away from the food or the first part that a surgeon uh, would touch is the serosa uh, layer. And this is the covering um, of the GI tract. Moving back out, as we kind of work our way down the GI system, we'll kind of touch uh, each of these uh, particular areas um, one at a time. We start with the oral cavity, the pharynx. It's in the mouth with it. And I think that this particular part is very uh, intuitive for people. It's the mechanical digestion, the actual chewing, using your teeth, the breaking down uh, of the carbohydrates in particular um, with your teeth and, and your tongue with it. Uh, saliva is, uh, is produced from a lot of these uh, salivary glands uh, in the mouth. Um, and then as uh, you swallow, the, fer the pharyngeal muscles contract and you push down into the esophagus uh, with it. And as you move down into the esophagus, you get this idea of peristalsis. And that's a word that's very commonly used. It's, it's a very complex a neuromuscular pattern. Your book doesn't emphasize all that, so I am not going to get into that. It's essentially the way your body moves the food uh, from the mouth all the way down into the stomach. Um, it has a very rich vascular uh, supply to it from the carotid, the uh, uh, different arteries uh, with it. Um, we often divide the esophagus into three different parts, the superior, the mediastinal, and the inferior part with it. 
Um, the esophagus doesn't do much for breaking down the food. It is purely a pipe that moves uh, material down into the stomach uh, with it. Um, as the food gets into the stomach, the stomach is divided uh, into four different areas, the cardiac sphincter, the fundus, the cardia, there's the body, and then the pylorus is at the very end um, of it there. These are not areas that are grossly seen. You can't look at a stomach and say, ah, yes, there's clearly the fundus area. Uh, these are um, areas uh, that are uh, seen both histologically and are just vaguely drawn uh, anatomically. Uh, the stomach is more on the left side uh, of the abdomen. It's in the left upper quadrant. Uh, with it is immediately under the diaphragm uh, with it. The exact size can vary quite a bit on, on individuals. It can vary depending on uh, your food intake and, and how uh, you have been digesting over the last couple of days. Um, and then obviously the stomach ends uh, with a pyloric sphincter uh, that empties into the uh, small intestine uh, with it. Uh, the four areas um, do have slightly different um, anatomical uh, parts to it, the body being the largest part, the pylorus being uh, the part that's richest in the uh, blood supply, uh, needed mostly to help get the food into the small intestine. Uh, there are three main arteries, or the blood supply, that helps keep the stomach uh, rich and full of nutrients. There's the left gastric artery, the splenic arteries, and then one called the hepatic uh, the common hepatic artery uh, with it. And that is something that the book emphasizes and could be used for testing, which is what are the different blood supplies to the uh, stomach. Uh, the stomach clearly is a digestive process. Uh, it is very active. The, stump, the food moves around uh, in the stomach. It is very active. People can hear their stomach growling. They can hear it, uh, the food being broken down. Uh, with it, and as the food breaks down, it breaks into something that we call chyme, C-H-I-M-E. Some people do pronounce it C-H-Y-M-E. Uh, it can be spelled either which way. Uh, and that is just the breakdown product of the food uh, as it digests uh, with it. And then this chyme actually exits the stomach through the pyloric sphincter and into the uh, small intestine. Small intestine, somewhere between 15 and 25 feet, uh, if you were to take it and stretch it all the way out. However, in your body, it's somewhat balled up. It takes a very uh, uh, loop-de-loo uh, type of uh, tract, and so it is not uh, clearly 25 feet uh, long with it. It touches every quadrant of your abdomen. It is a very frequent uh, insult in a stabbing or a shooting or any kind of uh, penetrating injury, uh, only because it, it's this kind of uh, uh, twisting and turning uh, type of path. Uh, it is divided into three different parts just to exhaust us more. You can't just call it the small intestine. The first part is the duodenum, the duodenum, some people will call it. Then comes the jejunum and then the ileum. All three of these parts do different types of digestion uh, for the nutrients and so we will talk about all three of these uh, separately. Uh, the duodenum is the shortest. Uh, it is a very C-shaped one part of it is it's hooked up to the stomach through the pyloric sphincter, and the other part is hooked up to the uh, jejunum. Uh, it is predominantly in the retroperitoneal cavity. We're going to talk a little bit about what that means uh, in a little bit. And it certainly uh, aids quite a bit in the digestion uh, of uh, nutrients with it. The jejunum uh, is where the bulk of the digestion and absorption of all your nutrients uh, is. Um, people find this quite interesting. It takes um, nearly halfway through the GI tract till you're seeing the bulk of the digestion and absorption uh, in the, uh, the jejunum part. You're not seeing the majority of it in the large intestine or the stomach, which is a common mistake uh, that people think. But it's the, predominantly the small intestine in the middle of the small intestine where a lot of your absorption actually takes place. Uh, the ileum uh, is the uh, terminal or the end part of the small intestine. Uh, it is about eight feet long. It actually has a valve. Uh, at the end of it. This is uh, quite emphasized. Uh, at the end of the small intestine and the beginning of the large intestine is the, uh, the valve, uh, the ileal cecal valve um, is what it is particularly called, um, predominantly to halt or to control the flow of nutrients into the large intestine. Uh, the large intestine is a, a, almost a square-shaped uh, process. Uh, it ends, as you can see in the right lower quadrant, the end of the small intestine where your ileocecal valve is dumping into the cecum. Uh, 
the intestine, the large intestine, uh, is one of the more odd structures in that you actually ascend the first part of it and you actually move up into the uh, right upper quadrant. It's one of the few places in your body that you actually go against gravity. Uh, the, the food at that point then moves across the transverse colon, down the descending colon, and into the sigmoid um, before it moves uh, into the rectum. Uh, the one thing I will emphasize on this uh, slide uh, is the appendix. It's noted in the right lower quadrant there, just uh, uh, next to the cecum. Uh, we hear quite frequently of appendicitis. Uh, it's a frequent transport for uh, paramedics, is right lower quadrant pain, nausea, vomiting. We clinically think quite a bit of appendicitis there. Um, and so I will note that the appendix is actually part of the large intestine. Uh, it looks like a rat tail is off it's frequently uh, described. Um, we suspect that it plays parts in the lymphatic system. It is not actually a uh, part uh, where the uh, food or the breakdown uh, takes place. And as you can see graphically from this, to take out that appendix uh, does not significantly uh, limit your large intestine uh, in any way, shape, or form. Uh, the large intestine is about five feet long. It's uh, responsible also for uh, ending the uh, reabsorption electrolytes and uh, vitamins uh, with it. Um, it is uh, uh, a, a very large uh, intestines. It's much bigger in diameter than the small intestine. It's very visually able to be seen. It has quite a bit of, uh, of uh, arteries uh, that uh, help keep it uh, very rich uh, in blood supply as it is such a large uh, object in your uh, abdominal wall. Breaking it down again, uh, the cecum is the part that the, the small intestine uh, material dumps into. Um, it is quite small. It's often described as a pouch with it. As you can see, it is right next to the appendix. So if you were to have a particularly bad bout of appendicitis, you could actually get some cecal uh, irritation or infection uh, with that. The ascending colon uh, is in the right side. It moves from the lower abdominal wall up to the upper uh, abdominal wall, uh, going right near your liver in the right upper quadrant. The colon then turns and heads sideways from the right side to the left side in the transverse colon uh, here. Uh, as it continues, uh, the uh, sigmoid uh, dumps down into the uh, rectum. The rectum is the very end of the large intestine. It is still considered part of the large intestine. Uh, it's about the last five to six inches uh, of your large intestines, and that area uh, is certainly for your uh, uh, fecal material. Uh, all digestion uh, has been done uh, at this point in time. Stepping away from the actual GI tract, but looking at your abdominal cavity as a whole, if you were a surgeon and you were to cut into your abdomen and you were to look inside, we divide the abdominal cavity into three spaces, the peritoneal cavity, the retroperitoneal cavity, and then the pelvic uh, cavity. These are not uh, very easy to understand. This is something that's often very new for paramedics uh, to understand. It's very common that the surgeons were to speak of these uh, three spaces, and you may hear it uh, uh, mentioned, uh, particularly we use it when somebody is bleeding in their cavities. The surgeons will use terms like this as a retroperitoneal bleed or a peritoneal bleed, or the bleeding is in the pelvis. Um, different organs are considered to be in these three spaces uh, in particular, uh, and we do appreciate them uh, when we open somebody up. The peritoneal space contains most of the organs uh, of your uh, abdominal uh, area. It would be more anterior or in the front, closer to your uh, belly button. The stomach, the duodenum, the liver, the gallbladder, the spleen are all in uh, this particular area. So as you can imagine, a stabbing uh, uh, near your belly button or to your abdomen uh, is very likely to cause a peritoneal uh, bleed. Towards the back, we have a couple organs in this retroperitoneal space, predominantly the ki kidneys, the ureters that come out of the kidneys, uh, the end of the duodenum, some colon, and then your pancreas uh, is in the back. So stabs to your back, uh, stabs to the sides are more likely to cause a retroperitoneal uh, injury with it. And that's a very common term that we would use in the emergency room. And a critical care paramedic transporting a trauma would uh, it would be very wise of them to understand where this bleeding is coming from, as we could understand what organs would be affected by a peritoneal or a retroperitoneal uh, injury. The pelvis is in the inferior 
uh, part or the lowest part of your uh, abdomen. This contains your bladder, uh, your rectum, and then the female uh, retro or, uh, ovaries, fallopian tubes uh, with it. And so as you could imagine, with gravity, if somebody were walking around with a bleed, most of the bleeding using gravity would fall towards the bottom of the abdominal compartment or in the pelvic space. Any uh, injury to the female reproductive system would cause pelvic bleeding uh, with it. And so that is why we use these terms. And I think it's important that paramedics are familiar with these terms, although uh, you won't be able to clinically diagnose whether something's in the peritoneal or retroperitoneal. But if you get report of one of these types of issues, it should help you understand where exactly they're bleeding from. A couple other terms I wanted to mention, they're not organs of the GI tract, they are in the abdom abdominal cavity, uh, and they're things that I don't think are uh, common, commonly understood in the layman's terms are the ideas of an omentum and a mesentery, and I want to spend a couple of minutes on these because many of you may never have heard uh, these terms before, uh, but they're quite important to the surgeons, and anytime a surgeon opens somebody up, they're stuck dealing with the mesentery and omentum. The mesentery uh, is essentially a, a, a conduit or a vascular network. It almost uh, looks like a sheet of paper uh, that helps connect all the organs so that they don't move. When you suddenly stop a car, your intestines don't unfold and refold. Your liver doesn't move from the right upper quadrant to the left side. Everything kind of stays stuck to where it's supposed to be. And the mesentery is this uh, connection of these uh, 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 tissues that keeps everything where it's supposed to be, whether you're running or in an in a, a aggressive I I athletic activity, things don't rearrange inside of you. It's almost like the glue that keeps everything together. And within this area is all the nerves and the blood vessels that run throughout uh, your abdominal wall. And as you can imagine, if you need to remove an organ, you have to dissect or cut out part of this mesentery uh, in order to get to the organ. You can't just reach in and nicely scoop out your liver. You have to kind of cut out the mesentery or, or the glue uh, that sticks this into its particular area. Similarly is this idea of the omentum. There's two of them. We call it the greater and the lesser uh, omentum with it. Um, and it literally looks like a yellow sheet, like a, 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 a shade that's on a window um, that you encounter uh, in your abdominal wall. Um, and it is, uh, in the same way, it's fat, it's adipose tissue, and it is to insulate and protect uh, these uh, organs. So as you can imagine, same thing when you do a surgery, you can't just easily remove it. You will have to go through the uh, omentum with it. Same point in time, another uh, transport that critical care paramedics will do quite a bit is for a small bowel obstruction. And we're going to talk a little bit about that when we reach the pathophysiology part of this lecture. But as you can imagine, once you destroy the omentum or the mesentery, it's not very easy to repair. It's hard to repair glue um, with this. We don't transplant one person's omentum into another one. And so once you destroy this and the surgeon has to remove an organ or take it out of the body to repair it and then put it back in, uh, your, the way that all these organs are placed back into your abdominal cavity are going to be slightly different. Um, and all the twists and the turns of the small bowel, the large bowel, the exact location of these organs are forever changed. And that can lead to some pathology. And part of that reason that we're having these problems is because we don't have any great way to reproduce an omentum and a mesentery after uh, those have been uh, removed or destroyed. We've now gone through the entire uh, GI tract. We started with the mouth. We went down the esophagus. We talked about the stomach. We talked about the small intestine, the large intestine, and the rectum. We talked a little bit about what all those organs do uh, for your body uh, in that regards. I want to then talk about all these accessory muscles or the uh, organs that help aid uh, all these GI uh, organs uh, in what they need to do. Uh, we'll talk quite a bit about the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas, as those are the three most important organs uh, that your body uses. Uh, the liver is absolutely gigantic on a lot of s uh, skinny people, people uh, whose li li uh, ribs are very 
uh, easy to palpate. You can actually feel your liver. You can feel it often in babies and in small children. It is in the right upper quadrant. It's right underneath your ribs uh, with it. Um, and it is divided into uh, two main parts, the right lobe and the left lobe. It has a ligament that runs uh, right down the middle dividing the two, uh, the falciform ligament. Um, with it, that's very visible ligament. We see it quite a bit uh, when we do uh, operations uh, on people. Uh, there's the ligamentous teres as well with it. Um, and then hiding, as you can see in this picture, directly under the liver is the gallbladder. In fact, they're often what we call adhered uh, or stuck together. Uh, they're very uh, close uh, in uh, anatomic position to one another. Uh, the blood supply to the liver is very important. The liver's main job is detoxification. Uh, you only have one liver. You can't live without your liver with it. And so most of the blood through your body at some point goes through your liver. Uh, the artery supply, or the blood that runs to your liver, uh, is the hepatic artery. Um, if you were to have one pump of your uh, heart, 25% of that blood is ultimately going to go right to the liver. That's how important the liver is uh, to your body. Uh, and then out after the liver kind of does what it needs to do, the venous output, or where the blood comes out of, is the hepatic vein going directly into the vena cava. Uh, the liver does quite a bit. Uh, I don't think that we truly know everything the liver does. We uh, find that the predominant things that it does is, number one, is the regulation of different metabolic features. Uh, it helps uh, circulate, break down the carbohydrates, fats, and amino acids, the life supply of your body. Um, it also helps circulate new red blood cells. It helps eliminate uh, those toxins from your body. And then it also produces bile that helps break down fats in particular um, with it. After bile is made, it dumps into the gallbladder, which is essentially just a storage device. And then it is excreted into the duodenum. And as you recall, most of the breakdown of all of your nutrients is in your small intestine. And as you remember, the duodenum is the very first part of your small intestine. And so this makes a lot of sense that the bile that helps break down fats and all the nutrients that your liver creates is broken down into the first part of the small intestine. It's not broken down into the esophagus or the stomach. It's broken down into the small uh, intestine. And that predominantly is, is because that's where the liver does uh, dump in all of these nutrients. The gallbladder, as I mentioned, is actually uh, uh, attached uh, to the liver. And it will store and it will concentrate in your bile. At times, it will overly concentrate your bile and form gallstones, which is something I think we're all very familiar with. And oftentimes, when your right upper quadrant hurts after food, the problem is not that something's wrong with your liver, but it's often the gallbladder because it's directly behind uh, the liver. Um, the gallbladder stores this bile for when it's used. When is it needed? Well, when you have a particularly fatty meal. Bile only breaks down fats, not carbohydrates, only fats with it. And so when it is needed, the cystic duct connects the gallbladder to the duodenum with it. This bile knows it needs to come out when, it, when your body has a high level of CCK. That is the go, or the green flag, if you will, that the bile is needed uh, to be uh, utilized. Now, the gallbladder um, really is not a critical organ in your body. Millions of people live without their gallbladder every day. It is purely a storage device for the bile. Bile is not made in the gallbladder. And that is a common test question in the critical care is where is the bile made? The answer is, is actually in the liver. The gallbladder is purely a storage device for it. Many people get their gallbladder removed. Do they still make bile? Yes. Does the bile still go into the duodenum? Yes. Does it go into the gallbladder? No. The gallbladder is gone. Um, at this point in time. And so, yes, you can live without your gallbladder. It is purely the storage uh, device with it. Moving now from the right upper quadrant to really the middle part uh, of your upper abdomen is the pancreas. The pancreas is very deep in your abdominal cavity. It's near your back. It's closer to your spine than it is to your front. Therefore, it's in the retroperitoneal surface. So if your pancreas were to rupture open and were to be bleeding, you would be having a retroperitoneal bleed. It is about six inches long, 
Most surgeons describe it more as a gelatinous structure like jello. You can't just grab your pancreas and whip it out because um, it actually somewhat melts. It has a lot of blood supply to it, predominantly through the pancreatic and pancreatic duodenal uh, artery with it. And as you can see, it's in very close contact with your stomach, your small intestine, and your gallbladder. The pancreas creates an awful lot of enzymes. Some of them are for digestion. We talked a little bit about the bile that helps break down fats. The pancreas also has enzymes that help break down fats, but it also has the enzymes to help break down carbohydrates, lipids, and all these other um, particular uh, foods that you're eating. Those are called the exocrine functions of the pancreas. There's endocrine functions of the pancreas, and the one that we're most common with is insulin. If you're a diabetic, you don't have enough insulin, it's often because your pancreas was either created wrong or is malfunctioning with it. I want to keep in mind that these endocrine functions, there are two other ones, and we're not going to emphasize this. Your book doesn't emphasize it. It's never been critical, but along with the insulin is the glucagon and the somatostatin. Those help aid in these exact same endocrine functions of controlling your glucose, controlling your energy um, with it. I want to emphasize again that these three accessory organs, the food never goes in the liver, never goes in the gallbladder, never goes in the pancreas, but they are critical to aiding the GI tract. And they're very close uh, to one another. They have similar blood supplies. They're physically very close to one another. And they work very close in hand in getting all these hormones uh, to work with one another. Um, and that they, if one of these were to go wrong, if the liver were to malfunction, it's very common to have issues with the gallbladder and the pancreas. Similar, when your pancreas is to malfunction, it's very common to have uh, your liver start to malfunction as well. They work very hand in hand in homeostasis with your body. We've talked about it a couple of times. I'll just make sure that I emphasize it one more time. This is the last slide on the GI uh, particular part of the physiology, which is the salivary ducts. There's the parotid uh, ducts, the submandibular, uh, glands and the sublingual glands. They are all there to help break down um, the saliva uh, that goes immediately into your mouth. Uh, and there are multiple of these that help make uh, saliva. That concludes the part of the GI anatomy review. I did not uh, go through every slide in depth. I want you, uh, the students, to make sure that they're reading the book. They're understanding all the details of all of these organs. My goal here is really just to provide an overview um, of all these uh, organs and to uh, provide what I find to be the critical parts uh, of knowledge for those. We're going to move now to the urinary system and just touch on this very briefly um, with it. Some books uh, de-emphasize this urinary system. Uh, in particular, but I did just want to touch on it very briefly um, with it. Uh, the urinary system clearly begins with the kidneys. You have two kidneys, the right and left uh, kidney. Their predominant job is to filter the blood. It deals a lot with making sure that your body is not too acidic or basic, detoxifies uh, your body, and then ultimately creates urine. Uh, the kidneys are small. They're bean-shaped uh, organs uh, with it. Out of the kidney comes the uh, ureter. The ureters dump down into the bladder, and then the bladder ultimately enters into the urethra, where the urine comes out of. Uh, the kidneys are very common uh, in describing three zones. The outermost zone is called the renal cortex. The middle zone is the medulla. And the innermost is called the pelvis with it. And they each do different parts. If you had a microscope and you were looking at the kidney, you would see what are called nephrons. There's hundreds, if not thousands, of them uh, in the kidney. And these are the little working units of the kidney. There are many of them. They are always working inside your body. And their main job is to regulate the acid base uh, of your body. Uh, when you zoom in and you were to look at one of these uh, nephrons, you'll see that the blood in the urine takes this very winding course uh, with it, um, with the blood supply very intimately attached to these twists and turns with it. And the ultimate goal is to make sure that any toxins is not missed in the blood, and any nutrients that may have accidentally been sucked into the kidneys are actually returned 
uh, to the blood, there's this very long check and balance. And uh, in medical school, when we study the nephron, we study every millimeter of the systems and understanding where in these little nephrons uh, toxins leave the blood, any toxins um, are, are fully absorbed, anything that's accidentally uh, created into the urine actually has a chance to go back into the bloodstream. It's not highly emphasized in this critical care lectures and it's actually quite uh, complex. And so I'm not going to touch on that in particular um, other than to mention just a couple of highlights. And again, these nephrons are microscopic. You can't see them doing this. It's far too, s too small to see with the naked eye. But there is one particular part you'll see in the lower part where you see the descending and the ascending limbs there, or loops as we call it, the loop of Henle. And in this particular area is where most of the uh, toxins are eliminated in the nephron um, with it. The first part of it would be called the, uh, the, um, the arterial uh, coming from the glomerulus. And then in the very end, the, the distal tubular is uh, where the final check and balance is done. The capillaries or the um, blood supply to it is ultimately where the good, rich uh, blood is eliminated. The urine is full of the toxins at this point in time. The, uh, after this uh, moving of the nutrients and the toxins is done, the ureters remove the urine uh, down into the bladder. I think we're all very familiar with the uh, bladder. Um, when you get somewhere around 350 to 400 cc's of urine uh, in your bladder, uh, you have the urge to urinate. The urine comes out the urethra, uh, and you are able to avo avoid out your uh, urine. And we're able to test very easily when this urinary system fails, or we call it renal failure. And it can be due to any four parts of the system when it fails, whether it be the kidneys, the ureter, the bladder, or the urethra. On the slide here is a number of different reasons that you can have acute renal failure, ARF, uh, as we call it. Um, and I won't touch on these in great detail. They're emphasized in your book. The goal is just to realize that there are a number of different problems that can go wrong in the urinary system to cause you to have failure of the system. We'll touch briefly here on the reproductive uh, system. It's not the emphasis of this lecture. However, it's not mentioned anywhere else. Uh, and so the instructors wanted me to make sure that I at least mention these very briefly, uh, not the emphasis of this lecture. Uh, on the male side, uh, we have the testes, which is in the scrotum. Um, they uh, have a, a number of protections uh, with it. Uh, the sperm is ultimately created in the siniferous uh, tubulars or the seminal vesicles, as they're called, uh, draining into the uh, epididymis. When stimulated, uh, sperm uh, can be uh, placed through the penis in the ductus deferens area. Um, there are, are two ejaculatory ducts. They pass through the prostate, uh, which ultimately serves as the uh, exit uh, through the urethra. A priapism is the first pathology that we frequently see. Uh, it is extraordinarily painful. It's a prolonged erection uh, of the penis. There are two different types, the so-called high flow and low flow, uh, neither of which you can tell uh, in, as a paramedic. It needs certain blood testing to be able to tell which one uh, is with. Um, it is very common with uh, medications as well as sickle cell uh, disease to have one of those. Uh, the female reproductive system is all internal. You can't see it uh, by looking. It uh, involves the ovaries. There are two of them, the right and left, um, that produce eggs once a month. Those eggs pass through both uh, fallopian tubes down into the uh, uterus, uh, through the cervix, and out the uh, vagina. The uh, monthly cycle is not something that is emphasized here. It's just the gross anatomy uh, in this particular part. The uh, fetus or the baby when it's made is stored in the uh, uterus. When the cervix dilates up to approximately 10 centimeters, um, the baby will pass through a cervix and out uh, 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 into the uh, vagina and out um, into the uh, volvular area. The cervix is the so-called exit pathway between the uterus and the vagina. Uh, generally, it is completely closed. Uh, when a very complex hormone interaction begins, that's when the cervix starts to dilate, when you're approximately 40 weeks uh, pregnant um, with it. 
but the exact mechanism of that is not emphasized or even mentioned in your books. I am not going to uh, emphasize that in particular, um, but I wanted to make sure that at least you had a visual of what these two different uh, reproductive systems uh, look like. That concludes the first part of this lecture, which is uh, the anatomy and physiology part. I know that's a lot to take in, some of which is very easy to understand. A lot of the macroscopic uh, parts are very intuitive. You've seen before, you've learned before in your paramedic class. A lot of these interactions of the hormones, the microscopic uh, parts of this is new to you, it is very overwhelming. I would encourage you to read this chapter several times over and over again. Ask questions of what you don't understand. Um, my goal is not to make you all anatomy experts with this point, but at least to make sure that you're aware of these different anatomical parts, particularly as we talk about what can go wrong with each of these parts so that you can understand what you're transporting and can help you anticipate what could go wrong when one of these organ systems fails. We're going to move on to the, the second half of this lecture, which is really the pathology or what can go wrong uh, in these different tracks. We're going to talk quite a bit about uh, GI problems. It's unfortunately a, a particular system that can fail quite often um, with it. We're going to talk about not only how to assess if something's going wrong with the GI system, but ultimately how to treat uh, with it. The first thing we're going to talk about is GI bleeding. I'm sure it's something as paramedics you have seen quite a bit. The first part that we try to do as physicians is try to figure out where are they bleeding from. And we divide it into an upper GI bleeding and lower GI bleeding. And we really try to inquire, is it bleeding from the upper part or the lower part? Because it's going to make a difference on the medicines we give and how exactly we treat it. And so we ask patients, or if the patients can't talk, we're going to ask the paramedics, were they vomiting blood? making me think it's more of an upper GI problem. Was it black or tarry stools? Which would mean that the bleeding is probably in the upper part, and by the time it gets all the way to the rectum, that it's already black and dark. So black stools or tarry stools are more of an upper GI problem. Um, or is it actually bright red blood that's coming from the rectum? And these are things that are very important. So if a patient calls you and says, I just bled in the toilet, as disgusting as it sounds, it's very helpful to take a look. Is it bright red blood that's coming out? Is it black blood that's coming out? Is it somewhere in between almost maroon or purple blood? That will help us tell if the bleeding is coming from the stomach, the small intestine, or the large intestine. The other part of GI bleeding that we like to know is, is it briskly bleeding? Are they actively bleeding right now? Is there blood on your sheets from the transport in? Um, and how long has this bleeding been going on for? We always talk about ABCs. We want to make sure that if the patient's bleeding is very brisk, that we're monitoring their airway, we're checking their vital signs. Are they very tachycardic? Is their blood pressure very low? Is it hard to feel pulses? Are they very thready pulses? These are all things that we need to know when we're managing a GI bleed. I wouldn't feed anybody. There should be no water, nothing to eat or drink when they're having a GI bleed because the ultimate um, problem is that that food may obstruct our views to see where they're bleeding from. And so make sure that the patient doesn't eat or drink anything um, when you get in contact with them. GI bleeding can be very fatal. Uh, we have a lot of medications that can thin your blood that can make bleeding very worse. It feels like everybody nowadays is either on aspirin, Plavix, Coumadin. There's these new medications um, out there that can also thin your blood. And so we get very aggressive with making sure there are two IVs in these patients. We want large bore IVs. We want to get very aggressive in making sure that we can stabilize these patients. Even if they're not briskly bleeding right now, your entire GI tract could be filled with blood, and we just don't know yet how bad this bleeding is. And so I would urge paramedics, particularly with long transports, um, for a GI bleed patient to be very aggressive in getting that second IV in place and not just settling for a 22 gauge IV in the thumb, but really putting in aggressive anti-cubital IVs in these GI bleeding patients. We fluid resuscitate these patients. We don't want them to go into shock. We're very aggressive with starting normal saline boluses uh, in these patients. When they get to the emergency room, we're very aggressive in making sure that we're typing and crossing uh, their blood type, that we are ready to give them more blood if at all possible. We 
would encourage the paramedics, if you are able to give blood, that if blood is being hung for a GI patient, I want a critical par care paramedic that is capable of continuing that blood in route because that is ultimately what the patient is going to need. Blood loss of anything over about a liter, a liter and a half, is going to need to start to have blood replacement. And it is very easy uh, to lose a liter of blood in the GI tract. It's very long. If your stomach is bleeding, by the time it moves all the way through the pyloric sphincter, through your small intestine, your large intestine, that entire area can be filled with blood. And if they have one urge to defecate and they lose all that blood, it's very easy that you're already needing blood supply. And so that's why we get very aggressive with these GI bleeding. And we want you to really watch their hemodynamics. The first sign that the bleeding may be severe would be some mild tachycardia. They may feel a little weak and dizzy when you stand them to get onto your cot. Those are all things we need to know uh, as the physicians because those are signs that this GI bleeding could be very extreme. We like to watch them on EKGs. All this blood loss can lead to arrhythmias. The heart can suffer from this. It's not uncommon to actually suffer a small heart attack while having a GI bleed because of the blood loss with it. And so I want these patients on the cardiac monitor. I want to know constantly what their heart rate is. If you're in route and the heart rate's going from 70 to 90 to 110 to 130 in route, that's worried about a patient that's decompensating, even if they're not actively bleeding onto your cot, they may be bleeding internally into their GI tract. We want to know things like, are they incontinent? Are they having large amount of diarrhea? Are they been constipated? Have they been vomiting all day? Those are very important factors that we need to know from our paramedics. Um, upper GI bleeds are about four times uh, more common than lower. We're seeing a lot of this problem. It probably isn't a day that goes by that we're not seeing them in one of our hospitals with it. Over 100,000 patients are admitted every year just for an upper GI uh, bleed management. It's very common for us to see these. It's very common for them to activate a critical care paramedic. Some of them need very specialized care, and we're transferring from facility to facility. Uh, and so this will be a very common call uh, in your career uh, that you see. The death rate is about 10% in these. That hasn't changed. They uh, can be very lethal. We have seen many patients code in route to our facilities uh, because of a GI bleed. That's why I want the IV fluid started immediately, two IVs placed, put them on a cardiac monitor in this point in time. We are seeing all these blood thinning medications, the elderly patients, they're just not able to handle these GI bleeds. Uh, and so we do need to watch these very aggressively uh, in your ambulance in the back. What causes them to bleed? Well, a number of things can go wrong. The most common are stomach ulcers. Too much acid in the stomach, in the duodenum, even in the ulcer, uh, can wear away to the point that they start to bleed uh, in them. They can er uh, er erode. We're going to talk a little bit about varices, dilated veins, a blood vessel rupturing open into your esophagus can be rapidly fatal. We're going to talk a little bit about Mallory Weiss tears, as well as they are quite common this day and age. Lower GI bleeds. Uh, happen predominantly in the large intestine. They can happen at the very end of the small intestine as well. These are also fatal, somewhere around 10% of the time. One in 10 will die. The most common is diverticular disease, and we're going to talk quite a bit about diverticulitis and diverticulosis um, with it because it is a very big problem this day and age. We also see what we call AVNs, angiodysplasias. We see cancers and we see colitis causing GI bleeds in the lower tract um, with it. And we will be able to figure out what is causing these bleeds. However, despite the cause of them, they are all treated the exact same way. Two IVs, cardiac monitor, IV fluids, rapid transport to a hospital. Anticipate that these patients can go south en route. They can go south very quickly. Um, we have to have a very high concern for these patients. You will never be faulted for being overaggressive in a GI uh, patient. Let's move to another uh, pathology that is very common, particularly in the urban population uh, in the Milwaukee area, peptic ulcer disease. These ulcers are very common, the mucosa of the esophagus, the, the uh, stomach, the small intestine uh, can wear away. It tends to uh, expose areas of the GI tract. An ulcer is just what you could imagine is the wearing away of part of the lining. Um, 
peptic ulcers are in the, the stomach in and of itself um, with them. We see that about 16% of all ulcers are in the stomach, somewhere around 30% are in the small intestine. They're also in the esophagus, and so it's very difficult for us to tell where they are just by talking to the patient, but they can be very painful. They can cause nausea and vomiting. Antacid uh, can eventually treat these. They are predominantly diet uh, 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 produced in nature. Bad diet can lead to these ulcers. The peptic ulcers can bleed if you wear away enough of the lining that you can actually erode a blood vessel. That's very common. It was much more common in the past before antacids, but peptic ulcers can wear away to the point that it wears all the way through the stomach, all the way through the intestines, and you actually have stomach or uh, intestinal rupture, uh, and that is an emergency uh, condition because essentially your stomach acid or your stool is draining into your abdominal cavity or your peritoneal cavity, uh, and that is a true emergency resulting in immediate and emergency surgery. Much more common before the invention of antacids, but it is possible that you could have a stomach ulcer or a peptic ulcer that goes so bad that it actually wears all the way through your stomach uh, and that we need to take in and patch out. We don't see that as much as these days as it actually erodes to the point that it starts to bleed, and a peptic ulcer actually turns into a GI bleed um, from erosion into a vein or an artery. Uh, these vessels that they wear into can be small, medium, or large. The bigger the vessel that it erodes into, the bigger the GI bleeding. Because these are predominantly upper uh, GI bleeds, you may see the vomiting of the blood, or you may see black, tarry stools with it. Unfortunately, peptic ulcer disease is very common to reoccur. Once you get ulcers, you're more common to get even more of them. And so a patient with a history of peptic ulcer disease who now having a GI bleed, even if it was remote, it's very common that they have recurrent peptic ulcer disease. The most common reason we see them is people are taking ibuprofen, Motrin, Aleve, or other NSAIDs. Very common for wearing away the stomach. Alcohol abuse, stress, very common for causing these ulcers to reoccur. We also see this disease called H. pylori, Helicobacter pylori. We know that that is now the most leading cause of getting these ulcers with it. To treat them, we actually need to give patients two, if not three, antibiotics to attempt to rid themselves of this Helicobacter uh, uh, infection. The problem is, is that it's often um, very difficult to treat. It's often uh, goes quite a while to where this helicobacter can get all over in the esophagus, in the stomach, in the intestines, and it can be a very difficult thing to treat, and patients will get reoccurrent over and over again infections with this. They'll get bad ulcers, they'll get bad pain, it'll start to wear away, and they'll start to bleed with it. And so peptic ulcer disease is a very recurrent problem. Once you get it, it's very common to have it for a lifetime. Stress-related Erosive syndrome is very common. These are stress ulcers that we see, very similar to peptic ulcer disease. We know very common that they can be due to trauma, to burns, to being in an intensive care unit, to being on a ventilator. All these stress-related syndromes can certainly lead to stomach ulcers. Any patient who's admitted to an ICU at most hospitals automatically is started on antacids to help prevent this from occurring. Because if a patient has a severe head injury, a severe trauma, and then they get these horrible ulcers and they start to get a GI bleed, as you can imagine, a body that's already under duress from a big surgery, a big issue, and now is having stomach ulcers from all these problems um, is a lot for a body to take on. And so ICU doctors, the trauma doctors, anybody who admits to the ICU is very aggressive in starting antacid medications and monitoring uh, for ulcers before they even begin, because this is often very fatal in these ICU patients. Long-term vent, many of you will go to these uh, long-term care facilities where patients are on long-term ventilators. It's very common for them to get GI bleeding, even if all their problems are predominantly respiratory, and so have a very low threshold for being very aggressive in these long-term vented patients. If they have a GI bleed, it's very common that it's an upper GI bleed, it's an ulcer, uh, and these patients can bleed quite heavily. The problem is, is that most of these patients are immunocompromised. Their immune system 
is off focusing on their predominant issue that landed them in the ICU. And the idea that their normal homeostasis and their normal uh, immune system has been broken down and they are just more at risk. The problem is, is that to fix them takes more energy, more problems because their uh, homeostasis and their ability to heal has already been compromised because they have another issue going on. This is a very common thing that we see uh, in the hospital is these stress-related ulcers. Next up, we're going to talk about gastritis. It goes hand in hand with peptic ulcer disease. It is also leading to the erosion, inflammation of the mucosa. This is what can easily lead to the peptic ulcers uh, with it. Um, it is very diet related. It uh, is uh, very common with this H. pylori. We can see it when we put a camera down, this redness, this inflammation that can certainly uh, occur with it. There are a number of different kinds of gastritis. We can get it from stress. We can get it from autoimmune in particular. Um, we can get it from the H. pylori. They're very common. They're treated very aggressively uh, with anti-inflammatory medications. We can get gastritis when somebody swallows something that they're not supposed to. Bleach, very common with it. As you can see from the pictures, you can actually see the gastritis. It is on the skin level. It is very easy. Um, for us to visualize this. And we want to get very aggressive, aggressive with the gastritis before it leads to the peptic ulcers. We see this in our cancer patients with their radiation. Unfortunately, radiation wears away the first lining of the stomach quite a bit. And even small doses of radiation can lead to gastritis. Any of our breast cancer patients or any other cancer patient who's undergoing radiation, they're very aggressive with always starting an antacid right off the bat to help prevent this cycle from starting with the gastritis. Varices is very serious. We see these a couple of times a year. Um, they're very common in patients who are alcoholics, who are cirrhotic, who have uh, liver failure. As you can see from these pictures, they're very dilated, meaty veins right in the esophagus. We can see patients have these veins ruptured open, and they can bleed to death within minutes. Um, it is often a very violent uh, bleeding. Their bleeding is profound. Um, when they have this, it is very rapid. These patients are usually very sick at baseline. They're not very healthy. Uh, they can often be a, a homeless population, a chronic alcoholic uh, that you can find. If those types of people are having a GI bleed, that is a true emergency um, with it. Uh, it can happen from easy as eating something like a potato chip or, or anything that's sharp or crunchy. If one of these veins uh, breaks loose, it can easily be a life-threatening emergency. About 60% of all patients with liver disease, and we're going to talk a little bit about what causes liver disease in a little bit, will develop these varices. They will watch any patient with liver disease sometimes every six months, sometimes every year by putting a camera down, by looking to see if they have varices. And the doctors are very cautious to tell them, you have varices. If you have any bleeding at all, you call 911 and you get shipped in uh, to the emergency room because the mortality rate is well over 50% at times uh, with these bleeds. These patients um, need to often be intubated very quickly. These patients need to be started on blood almost immediately. Uh, these are the patients that I, I would make sure that you are, are, are taking very serious because uh, their bleeding can be uh, extraordinarily uh, profound. Any, uh, any uh, long-term uh, liver uh, patient uh, has increased resistance to their blood flow, uh, and so the bleeding that can occur, the amount of blood that is in those veins, uh, can be quite massive uh, with it. And the problem is, is that a lot of these veins have increased pressure behind them, and any breaking loose can make them uh, bleed quite significantly and the rupture can be quite large to the point that their platelets can't clog that up. Many of these patients also have a decreased immune system, decreased platelet count, uh, and can make it very challenging for these bleeding to stop. Uh, they often need either emergent endoscopy, which we'll talk about, or emergency surgery um, as rapidly as possible. Along those same lines, not nearly as severe as what's called Mallory Weiss tear, and these are very common. These are little tears at the end of the esophagus. They're often caused from retching, from vomiting, 
We see this in people who are hungover. They're at home the next morning. They're vomiting quite a bit. The first couple of vomits are just regular vomit, and now they're vomiting pure blood. Um, this is something that we often see kind of early in the morning in the emergency rooms. I was up vomiting. It seemed just like regular vomit. Now, doc, all I am is vomiting blood. And what happens is all that intragra intragastric pressure from all this retching ended up causing a tear or a rip um, in the, the lower part of the esophagus. That rip is called a Mallory Weiss tear or Mallory Weiss syndrome with it. These will often stop spontaneously with them. We often need to watch them in the emergency room. We give them medicines to stop the retching and uh, antiemetics like Zofran, uh, Reglan, Compazine. We give them some IV fluids and we end up ultimately monitoring them for several hours to make sure that this doesn't get worse. Um, but this is very common. We see this in college. Uh, we see this in patients um, who are out celebrating. Maybe they don't drink as often. Uh, they start retching. They don't feel well. And then they ultimately end up having an upper GI bleed. On that note, I wanted to just take a pause as we end the kind of talking about the upper GI bleeding. We're going to move to the lower GI bleeding uh, on this idea of a patient has an acute abdomen. There's no frank definition for what an acute abdomen is. It is a medical term for meaning that their belly is very tender. I think something is very seriously wrong uh, in their abdomen. The most common things that can cause a quote unquote acute abdomen are gunshot wounds, stabbings, a ruptured aortic aneurysm, which would cause severe intra-abdominal bleeding. But if you have a patient who looks very ill, is sweating, doesn't seem to be talking to you, seems a little bit altered, you push on their abdomen and it seems very rigid, it seems like it's swelling with blood, they just seem really markedly tender on your exam, you'll often hear a doc say they have an acute abdomen. Now that is not a particular disease that's causing that. There are multiple different diseases that can cause an acute abdomen. Um, but I want you to just be familiar with that term. It usually means that someone is very concerned that something is very wrong in their abdomen. And any time that there is a suspicion for any of those problems, it should be a rapid transport. They should be on a cardiac monitor. They should have two IVs in place. They should be large IVs. And they should be getting uh, uh, IV fluids. And they should be very aggressively monitored en route by a critical care paramedic. And so if you hear that term, acute abdomen, I want your uh, warning lights to go on and for you to be very concerned for that patient. Well, let's move to the lower GI uh, tract now. We've talked a little bit about what happens when somebody bleeds into the stomach, in the small intestine. We're going to talk a little bit about lower GI bleeding uh, at first, as that's a very common, I imagine almost all of you have transported somebody with a lower GI bleed of first. And let's do the big player right up front, which is the diverticular disease. Diverticuli are very odd uh, looking. When you uh, look at somebody, they look like little mushrooms that have popped out of your uh, colon uh, in particular. And they're very common in America. They're often due to dietary issues. And they say up to about 70% of people will have diverticular uh, disease at some point in time. When you look at them, uh, with uh, the endoscopy and you go through the GI tract, as you can see in this picture, they look like little holes have been punched out uh, in your colon. They're very odd looking as you pass through and they're very common. However, having a diverticuli in and of itself isn't serious. There are two things that can go very wrong with them. They can get inflamed or they can wear away to the point they wear into a blood vessel and they can bleed. When they bleed, you have diverticulosis. And it's very common, you'll hear docs say, osis bleeds. Diverticular bleeds are when these um, holes in your GI tract actually perforate into a blood vessel and they can bleed. Sometimes this pain uh, can cause uh, a quite a bit of uh, inflammation. And when these little pouches get infected or have inflammation, we call it diverticulitis and they can get a lot of pain. That pain is predominantly on the left lower quadrant part of their abdomen. Sometimes it can be in the right lower quadrant of their abdomen. Obviously with right lower quadrant, we also worry that's where the appendix is. And so we often joke that diverticulitis is left-sided appendicitis um, with it. Osis bleeds 
itis has pain is a very common saying in medical school. Um, diverticular bleeds are very common. They can be very deadly, um, particularly depending on how big of a blood vessel they wear into. Um, they, it's usually bright, bright red blood uh, out of your rectum. It is very uncommon to have vomiting blood from a diverticular bleed. When somebody has this, we get very aggressive in the hospital. We check their blood counts. We get them typed and screened. We get them uh, blood ready in case it's needed. And we call our GI doctors as they need to have an endoscopy. They need to know how many diverticuli there are, how big is the bleeding, how big is the blood vessel. Sometimes we can fix these diverticular bleeds just with an endoscopy. Sometimes, depending on how many they have, how many times they're bleeding, sometimes they need surgery. The way we tell this is, is that we do what's called endoscopy, or we put a camera either down their mouth or up their rectum, and we are able to visualize what is going on. Now, this can be a little difficult at times. If they're bleeding quite heavily, we need to do a lot of suction to really see where the bleeding is coming from. If they're bleeding too briskly, we won't be able to tell where the bleeding's coming from. Secondarily, if they just ate a Big Mac on the way in, all that food is going to get in the way of seeing where the bleeding's coming from. If they have a lot of stool in their rectum, we're not going to be able to see the walls, and so endoscopy is not always the most ideal study. However, it is the most common thing that we start with to try to figure it out. The other thing we can do is, is we can um, do what we call a tagged red blood cell uh, scan with it. And that is we take some red blood cells because it is your blood. We put a uh, nuclear uh, tag on it. We take out your blood, we put this tag on, and we actually put the blood back into your body. And we take pictures of your GI tract and we try to figure out where those tagged blood cells are coming out and bleeding from. And that will at least give our GI doctors and our surgeons a clue for what part of the GI tract is bleeding from. Do those red blood cells come out from the stomach, the small intestine, the large intestine? We also use this if we think that they're bleeding in the small intestine. If we do what's called an EGD or we do an endoscopy down the mouth, that scope can only get to the duodenum. We cannot scope from the mouth and get all the way through the GI tract. Similarly, when we do a colonoscopy, we can only get to the ileum or the end of the small intestine. And so most of the duodenum, the ileum, and the jejunum, we can't get with endoscopy. And if we think you're bleeding in that middle part, these tagged red blood cell scans are something that we can use because endoscopy won't help us. The other thing that's rarely done nowadays that we can do is, is we can actually poke somebody in, the, in a leg or an artery and we can snake a little coil up and we can actually put it in all these different arteries and see which one has broken loose. Now that's a lot of contrast. That's a very invasive study. You have to put somebody to sleep. You have to snake these uh, angiography coils into all these different arteries to see what is bleeding. But it is an option that we have to do angiography, although we don't see that done nowadays in particular. I'll say it once again because it is so common and is so uh, frequent that critical care paramedics see these GI bleeds. I want you to be very aggressive with ABCs, uh, uh, normal saline, giving blood, putting them on a cardiac monitor, and taking these very serious. I'll mention a couple of other things that we do in rare instances. We'll talk about some balloon tamponade. We'll talk about atriotide. Atriotide uh, balloon tamponade tips procedures are all used for these variceal bleeds, these cirrhotics who can rupture open veins uh, anywhere in their GI tract. Um, we'll talk, we'll show you a picture of a balloon, uh, the, the Blakemore tube in a little bit. Atriotide is a medicine that is given as a drip. It won't help all GI bleeds. It really only helps patients who are having a variceal bleed. TIPS is an emergency surgery where we try to decrease the pressure in these veins. You can't do it while somebody is having an active uh, variceal bleed, but it is a, a liver surgery that can be done to try to decrease the pressure. And so if you have a patient who's having a GI bleed and they tell you, oh, I've had a TIPS procedure done or I've had a couple of TIPS procedures uh, done, um, you should be very concerned that what they're actually having uh, is a variceal bleed. 
And I'll mention uh, NG tubes now quite a bit. We're going to show you very briefly how to put these in uh, later in this presentation. But if you put an NG tube down the nose into the stomach, and what's coming up is bright red blood, you can be very concerned that that bleeding is coming from the esophagus or the stomach. If they're vomiting blood, you put an NG tube down, and all that's coming up is stomach acid, yellowish green stuff, but no blood, then you can assume that the bleeding is probably coming from lower in the small intestine or the large intestine, or the bleeding has stopped. So putting down an NG tube uh, allows us to analyze the contents of what is coming up and help us kind of ascertain where this bleeding is coming from. Oftentimes we will give antacids in these GI bleeds because peptic ulcers are so common for causing these bleeds and so you will very commonly see us give IV antacid medications in an attempt to try to help heal the ulcers that have worn away. Um, and so I put this slide in only because you will frequently transport somebody who is on an antacid drip. The most common we see is IV protonics. Um, and it would be very common for you to show up to transport a patient having most likely an upper GI bleed from peptic ulcers, and they'll be getting IV fluid, possibly blood, and they may be on a protonic drip as well. And that is because we are assuming that this is ultimately a peptic ulcer bleed. Endoscopy is very common. We can see the bleeding quite actively. The nice thing about doing these endoscopies is not only can we see the ulcer, the diverticular bleed, the Mallory Weiss, the uh, varices that are bleeding, but we're also able to fix them. These are done by GI specialists. We don't do them as an emergency physician. There are some surgeons that can do this so that they can analyze uh, if the bleeding is brisk enough that they actually need to take them to surgery with it. Um, but you can often, they'll come down to the emergency room and do this. Um, and this is usually the go-to that we will ultimately do to not only figure out what uh, the bleeding is coming from, but they can also inject epinephrine. They can try to coil the bleeding. And endoscopy in most situations are actually able to fix the bleeding with endoscopy. And then they'll go in days to weeks later, and they will watch the bleeding to make sure it hasn't rebled to make sure the ulcers are healing up. And so endoscopy is really the way that we can identify ultimately what this bleeding is. And we can often fix the bleeding um, by injecting medicines or coils uh, through an endoscopy uh, to try to fix the bleeding. That's a lot about GI bleeding. Let's move to some of the other uh, pathology that we can see from the GI tract. Another very common thing we see is pancreatitis. Somebody has upper abdominal pain nausea and vomiting, we think quite a bit about pancreatitis. Those enzymes in the pancreas are very toxic to the body. A lot of the breakdown of your, of your food uh, can occur. And when those uh, pancreas gets inflamed, it really can activate all those enzymes and it really goes into overdrive with it. Um, a, a inflamed pancreas can be an extraordinarily painful a phenomenon, you'll see patients yelling, screaming, writhing in pain um, with it. All that pain is due to the release of these enzymes that the pancreas uh, produces. And these, the blood flow to the pancreas and the fact that the pancreas is in the retroperitoneum and it's very deep um, makes this pain to be very profound um, for patients. They're often nauseous, they're often vomiting um, with it, and that is due to all these releases of all these enzymes that normally shouldn't be released so aggressively um, with it. The uh, course or of uh, pancreatitis uh, can be from very minor to life-threatening. It is often something that will put patients in the ICU for they can get very septic, they can die. There's a lot of complications that can occur from pancreatitis. When we think of it, we often think of alcoholics. Alcoholics can ban burn out their pancreas, they can get pancreatitis over and over and over again. We see it uh, at times when people go out for a bachelor, bachelorette party, they're celebrating their birthday, they drink too much. Next thing you know, they have this horrid upper abdominal pain, nausea and vomiting with it. As you can imagine, this can worsen things. Now you have pancreatitis, you're nauseous, you're vomiting from pancreatitis, now you get a Mallory Weiss tear. And so these can really steamroll into various serious GI pathology. You can get pancreatitis if a duct gets clogged. The most common reason a duct gets clogged, from a gallstone that gets stuck. Not in the gallbladder, 
but in, out of the cystic duct can come a uh, stone and it can get stuck. Then n all this enzymes that normally flows very nicely into your duodenum gets stuck. Your body tells your pancreas, hey, we're not seeing any of the enzymes in the GI tract, so it produces more and more and more enzymes. The next thing you know, they have pancreatitis because they have a clogged uh, gallstone. We can get this quite often from medications. High blood pressure medications are very well known for causing pancreatitis. High cholesterol levels can cause this with it. There are many different causes of this, not just alcohol. And one of the things I do caution uh, paramedics is when these patients get these pancreatitis, we're often quick to say, ah, oh, this must be an alcohol-induced pancreatitis. You know, this is, this is, you know, something they did to themselves. When in reality, we have to be very cautious as there are many other causes of pancreatitis that isn't something that they did to induce it. Um, the pain is often described as constant, boring, radiating to the back. It can start suddenly with it. These patients are often very profoundly in pain. They can have nauseous, they can vomit, they can have tachycardia. Their belly can be very tender. Some of the complications that can happen from pancreatitis is that the pancreas, with all these enzymes that are being excreted, can also wear away into a blood vessel and they can have some bleeding. We call that hemorrhagic pancreatitis. And the most common signs we see that is called Gray's Turner or Cullen sign, um, which is when you get some uh, bruising or it looks like bleeding around the belly button or on the sides. Uh, and that is something that is quite rare, we don't see, but something that we should be looking for, which is any sign that this pancreatitis has converted to a hemorrhagic pancreatitis. The way we check for it in the hospitals, we can check to see what the level of these pancreatic enzymes are. Now we can't check for every enzyme in the blood work, and the most common we look for is amylase and lipase. We know that the lipase is far more sensitive and specific, and so many hospitals will only check lipase. Some hospitals will check the amylase and the lipase. But when those are elevated, we get concerns that the patient has pancreatitis because there's too many of these enzymes in the blood. We also look at a couple other data points, and I mention these only so that you can understand where we're at to kind of determine how sick this pancreatitis is. Is it a mild pancreatitis or is it a major pancreatitis? We look to see if they're very anemic. Are their blood counts low? We look to see if their calcium is very low. That's very worried. Do they have a white blood cell count? Do they have a high glucose? Are their liver functions starting to be affected? I mentioned that the pancreas, the liver, and the gallbladder often are very intertwined. The more of these other blood tests that are out of whack, the worse this pancreatitis can be. We can do a CAT scan and we can see the inflammation uh, around the pancreas and that will give us a detail. How much inflammation is there? How much bleeding is going on? Does the inflammation look like it's wearing into a large blood vessel? And so we will often do CAT scans on these pancreatitis as a way to also help us understand how uh, significant the pancreatitis is. We can do an MRI, we can do an ultrasound. Sometimes those aren't quite as good as a CAT scan, but I just wanted to make you aware that we do image uh, these patients to make sure that we know how bad their pancreatitis is. The other thing that can happen with pancreatitis that we need to be aware of is, is that they can what's called form cysts or pseudocysts, which are uh, just like an abscess is a infection that occurs secondary to pancreatitis, like an a, a uh, interabdominal infection. And that's the other reason we do CAT scans is we want to make sure that there's not an infection forming around pancreatitis because at times it needs very aggressive antibiotics. So what do you do if you have a patient that you think has pancreatitis? You keep them uh, nothing by mouth. You don't want any stimulation that could increase more of these enzymes. You want these enzymes to calm down. So we give them IV fluids, we give them pain medications. We give them anti-nausea medications. We'll put an NG tube down because we don't even want stomach acid passing into the duodenum. We want absolutely nothing going into their small intestines. We will admit these patients to the hospital. If things get very bad, we will ultimately give them what's called IV nutrition, or we call it TPN, total parenteral uh, nutrition, so that at least they can get some nutrients, but that nutrients will go through the IV. It won't go through the GI tract. 
it can take often several days to weeks to get pancreatitis better. And so these will be patients, again, very aggressive, putting an IV in, giving them IV fluids, giving them pain medicines, giving them anti-vomiting medications, and they will ultimately very often be admitted to a hospital for management. Let's move to the other accessory organ that we, quite, we talk about quite a bit, which is the liver. When the liver fails, we call that hepatitis, and many different, many different things can cause hepatitis. We can get it from different kinds of infections. We can get it from different kinds of medications. Um, in the uh, liver, we have all different kinds of cells. Some of these dead cells get removed. However, when it gets very inflamed, the ability to detoxify uh, really goes down, and a lot of these uh, toxins can build up quite a bit and can make the liver worse and worse. When you have what's called uh, chronic liver failure or fulminant liver failure, unfortunately this is an ongoing issue and your liver will never get well. Acute liver failure is something that can often be fixed. The liver is able to fix itself. However, there are many times that unfortunately it can't chronically do it. And you will notice that there is a couple of precursors that we can tell and that you could be asking your patients if they have right upper quadrant pain, if they have nausea, vomiting, if they don't feel like eating, this can be leading towards a liver problem. Interestingly enough, we notice it quite a bit. Their urine can be very dark. Their stools can be very white. They can have yellowing of their skin or eyes, which we call jaundice or scleral icterus. They can start to get altered. A lot of these toxins that the liver breaks down can actually go up to your brain, and we see patients being altered. They seem unusual. They're not able to answer your questions. They can actually even be comatose. That can be a sign that a liver uh, problem is ongoing. And we have a number of different blood tests that we can do to assess the liver function. The most common that we do are what's called an ALT and an AST. These are signs that you have too much liver enzymes in your bloodstream. They shouldn't be in your bloodstream to that degree. We can check a whole other kinds bilirubin, albumin, ammonia. The goal is not necessary that the paramedics should know all these different uh, lab values, but that when you're getting report and the, and the nurse or the physician or whoever you're transporting tells you that their liver function is off, that their liver function is elevated, that you recognize that this is ultimately leading to a liver failure picture. There's not a lot we can do. There are some medicines that we don't give by paramedics that we can try to help clear uh, the liver. Um, but this is ultimately supportive care uh, with it. Liver transplants can be done. They are uh, rare. Uh, they are uh, done at only uh, a handful of facilities. Um, but that certainly is an option to help heal the liver. I wanted to include here just a couple of uh, slides on what would be normal and abnormal uh, uh, lab values. I'm not going to go through them one at a time, um, but I wanted to have these in here for your reference. Again, the same kinds of things uh, for uh, pancreatitis. I'm not going to go through an exhaustive list of all the different things that can cause liver failure, um, as there are multiple. Uh, we worry a lot about medications that can do it, a lot of different infections. You're all familiar with hepatitis B, hepatitis C. Alcohol can certainly ruin um, your liver. Uh, there are a lot of congenital uh, problems uh, that can ruin the liver. Um, the goal is not always to know what is causing the liver problems, but to recognize that upper abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, anorexia, yellowing of the skin, abnormal liver function, uh, will need to seek treatment um, and ultimately need an aggressive evaluation for why they are uh, in liver uh, failure. In that regards, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the devices that we as physicians use to help control the GI and GU uh, system. I think we've all seen dialysis catheters before. These are used when the kidneys fail, not the GI system, but the GU system. When the um, kidneys fail, if the patient can get a kidney transplant, that's phenomenal. If they can't get a, a transplant, what we do is ultimately put these catheters in, most commonly in an arm or a leg. They can be in an upper arm or a lower arm with them. 
It is where we connect an artery and a, a vein uh, together, where we ultimately will take the patient's blood out of their system, run it through a machine, and back through. If, um, when we put a catheter in, because we're connecting two blood vessels to each other, it takes several weeks to months before you're able to use that when you say that the, uh, the, the shunt needs to mature. So before we can do that, we actually put special IVs either in their neck, their shoulders, or their chest wall. And there's a number of different kinds of these that you'll hear about, but we can do dialysis through uh, these kinds of catheters in particular. As a uh, paramedic, we shouldn't have much to do um, with these catheters. Um, if they're infected, they, they should be uh, handled with care. Um, the bleeding from a, uh, a catheter or a shunt in the arm can be very severe. Direct pressure um, and rapid transport is certainly recommended uh, with these uh, types of uh, devices. NG tube is also something that I think paramedics need to be very familiar with. And in many agencies, you can actually put in NG tubes, and they're used for a number of different reasons. If the intestines are obstructed, um, you can help by decompressing the air by putting an NG tube in and then hooking them up to suction. We can suck out any contents. If somebody overdosed, we need to take out their pills. We want to um, suck out the stomach, an NG tube can do that. And then it can also be used, like we talked about, for pancreatitis or any times you want to rest the intestinal tract. The biggest things for critical care that we want to um, make sure is that we know how to check placement, that you can confirm it's working, how to put them in, and certainly make sure you don't pull them out en route. There are other kinds of NG tubes. Most commonly, we call them Dobhoff tubes or feeding tubes. These are much smaller in diameter um, with them, and they are not for sucking out blood. They are not for um, any sort of diagnostic test, but for people who can't eat. Someone who just had esophagus, stomach surgery, uh, somebody um, who may be uh, anorexic and having problems eating, we can put these small tubes in and deliver feeding through uh, this tube and have it dump right into the stomach. And those can be kept in for several weeks at a time. They're called feeding tubes or Dobhoff tubes. I want to mention this very briefly, how to put an NG tube in. Some of you will do this in your career. Some of you will never do this in a career. Um, it's best to have the patient sitting up. It's very difficult to put them in when a patient is lying flat. You want to uh, ideally numb up the nose, if at all possible. Um, it's not always used. You want to measure by going from the tip of the, uh, the nose. You want to go around the ear and then measure it down to the xiphoid process. And you want to mark that either with your finger or a piece of tape so that you know how long of, to stick the tube down. You then lubricate the uh, NG tube so it goes down very smoothly. And when you put it in the nose, you often want to put it straight back. And we tell uh, nurses, young doctors, medical students, paramedics, when they're learning how to put these tubes in, you don't want to aim it up towards the eyes. You don't want to aim it down towards the nose. You want to put it absolutely uh, parallel to the floor and go straight back. As it goes straight back, the tube will naturally start to curl down to the esophagus. We often will have patients drink or sip water with a straw to help open up uh, the esophagus. The sipping of the, of the water also helps distract them um, and gives them something to do so they're not focused at all on putting the NG tube back. You want to advance the tube slowly and firmly. Some patients will slightly gag as it, as it goes down. That gagging should resolve itself after it hits the stomach. And so I often will tell patients before I put a tube down that this will be a little miserable for uh, uh, 30 seconds or so until we can get the tube all the way down. You want to really watch their arms. Some patients, as you're putting this down, will reach up and try to grab the tube out. And you want to have somebody there to potentially watch their arms so that you don't get the tube down. The patient panics and rips the tube out. There's a number of different ways after the tube gets down into the stomach and, and to your mark that you want to confirm that the placement is just so. You can squirt a little bit of air down the NG tube. With your stethoscope, you can listen uh, over the stomach, as you're seeing in the middle picture here. If you hear a lot of stomach gurgling and air going in when you squirt that water or uh, air in, you can confirm that it's in placement. 
you can then suck back a little bit, and if yellowish green material comes out, you can be confirmed that you're getting stomach contents out. Most importantly, in my opinion, is to make sure that this tube is very well secured to their face. The last thing you want to do is, is put the patient through getting this NG tube in only to have it slide out in route. And so f you, to tape it um, to either an endotracheal tube or the face uh, or to use a commercial attachment device is very strongly recommended. There are other tubes that we use longer term, gastrostomy tubes, jejunostomy uh, tubes that can be put in by a GI doctor, a radiologist, or a surgeon. These are for more long-term uh, feeding, and uh, they're very common in patients either in long-term care facilities, nursing home facilities, patients with cancer, uh, very frequent transports with it, um, and they are when the food will not go through the esophagus or the mouth, but actually be dumped directly into the stomach or the small intestines with them. Um, and uh, they can be very long and they can be very uh, short in uh, length. They are uh, secured into the stomach with a, a little balloon, as you can see, um, and then they're often adhered to the skin with a bumper. Uh, they're very frequently used in uh, all ages of children, adolescents, and adults um, with them, and they're something that you will see accidentally pulled out uh, every once in a while. In the emergency room, we're able to replace the G-tubes as the amount that you have to put them in are very small. It's a relatively easy procedure um, to replace them. However, I do want to make note that some of these tubes actually go into the stomach through the pyloric sphincter and actually into the small uh, intestine. They can be a duodenal tube or a jejunal tube. These are much more complicated to put in, and you can put these in predominantly because, as we mentioned, most of the absorption of nutrients is done in the small intestine. Um, these are much longer. These are a little more complicated to push in, and so these are much more challenging when they get pulled out to put them back in. And us in the emergency room often need a specialist to assist with these. And so when you get called to a problem with one of these stomach tubes, the most important question is, is what kind of tube is this? Is it a G tube that goes into the gastric part of the stomach? Is it a J tube that goes into the jejunum? Sometimes there are what are called a D tube or one that goes into the duodenum that will help us uh, at the hospital determine what needs to be replaced. If you can even bring in the pulled out tube or the malfunctioning tube or the cut tube, that is equally as helpful to us. I will uh, make mention that there are these GJ tubes where they have two ports, one for the stomach and one for the intestine. And what those are often used for is, is a pill that needs to digest in the stomach can be put in the G part of the tube. Food can be put in through the J part of the tube so that it digests, and those are becoming much more common. For you folks, if they just happen to have one of these tubes, you want to make sure that they are secured, that they're not loose, that they're nicely uh, taped down and secured. You want to make sure that there's no bleeding, infection, or leakage around the tube. And you want to make sure um, that the tops or the little stopcocks on them uh, aren't open or can become dislodged in route. Less common is what is called a T-tube, and I know this feels like it's alphabet soup, and I apologize. There's G-tubes, J-tubes, T-tubes. It's absolutely exhausting to keep all these straight. A T-tube is something that we really only see after gallbladder or liver surgery, and they're relatively rare uh, nowadays, and they are named because they're T-shaped. If the bile um, is spilling out, if there was a uh, complication during uh, a surgery to remove a gallbladder, we don't want that bile spilling into the intra-abdominal uh, cavity. And so we will put one of these devices in. What will be in that tube um, is actually the bile of the patient. That's usually not permanent. That is just to allow that area to heal um, with it. But it's very important if a patient has a bag coming out of them that you want to understand where that bag is attached to and what is the specimen that's coming out of it. So if a patient says, I have a T-tube in place, you can assume a couple of things, that they likely recently had a gallbladder or liver surgery, and that what should be draining out is bile. This can put about a liter into this bag at one point in time, and they can stay in for well over a month at a time. 
And again, you want to make sure that this tube is very secured. You don't want this pulling out um, because then the bile will be spilling into their intra-abdominal cavity. And with well over a liter produced each day, even in the short transport in, uh, you can make that patient quite sick. And so you want to make sure that these tea bags are well secured and you want to assess how much drainage is in them. Unfortunately, there are some patients who we can't use a G-tube, a J-tube in, either their esophagus or their stomach due to cancer or a bad blockage, um, needs to be removed or is unable to be used at some point in time. And we need to feed them by alternative techniques. And the most common is what we call TPN, or total peripheral nutrition. Um, this is a science that's still being perfected. It's really not ideal. Doctors are, are, would prefer not to use TPN. It's often a last ditch uh, resort a nutrition, and it's essentially IV nutrition. It needs a nutritionist, a pharmacist to very, cal very closely calculate what goes into these bags. Um, but it really is a last resort. Unfortunately, TPN can lead to pancreatitis. There can unfortunately be germs, bacteria that can get into these bags. It doesn't always do a great job of nutrition. Um, they often need to be given continuous 24-7 to keep the patient uh, with nutrition. There's often a reason somebody's on TPN. They're usually not the healthiest people um, at baseline. And they're very at risk for either getting thrombosis or embolisms due to this frequent changing of these bags. Um, and so we really need to watch for complications with our patients who are on uh, TPN. An air embolism is just what it sounds like. It's a little uh, amount of air that gets into the blood supply. And it's most common when you're changing uh, these IVs. Uh, TPN is often not given in a regular IV. It's often given in what we call a PICC line or a central line um, so that TPN can go into a major blood vessel, not a peripheral um, one. And so these uh, air embolisms and thrombosis or clogs that can occur can be very serious in patients. You'll see patients are transported quite often because their catheter or the IV that the TPN accidentally falls out may become infected, needs to be changed. Um, and we want to get those changed as quickly as possible because these patients often need this TPN. It needs to be given 24 hours a day and that they can't go quite often um, long periods of times without receiving their TPN. And so you will get transports for this. You want to make sure that um, that area is quite clean, that it's covered, that any bleeding from the area um, is uh, dealt with with direct pressure. I promised you earlier I wanted to show you these Blakemore Minnesota tubes. Some people just call them Minnesota tubes. Some people call them Blakemore tubes. As you recall, these are tubes that we put down the mouth when somebody is having a variceal bleed. Often a patient who has liver failure, cirrhosis, um, maybe a chronic alcoholic with it. We don't put these down very often. I would argue that these are very rarely placed in the emergency room. Our preference would be to intubate the patient, to have a, a specialist come in and do endoscopy, a surgeon to do surgery. But if the bleeding is massive with a variceal or an upper GI bleed, we can put one of these tubes down. Um, they can be put down the nose. We often will just put them down the mouth. We inflate these large balloons. Um, in a goal to apply direct pressure to the bleeds. You can't stick your finger down their mouth uh, long and are far enough to really pressure these variceal bleeds. And so this is a, a way to try to tamponade or apply direct pressure uh, to these bleeds. Um, what we do is, is we try to put them on a pulley system so that they, we inflate them and then we pull them out of the mouth so that it is nice and taut with it. And one of the traditional ways of doing this is by putting a football helmet on the patient after intubating them, after putting down um, an NG tube, after putting down a Blakemore tube, um, and tying the end of the Blakemore tube to the uh, base guard of a football helmet. And so one of the running jokes in the storage rooms of the ERs is why do they have a football helmet in the storage room? And the answer is, is most often to in case we have one of these bad variceal bleeds um, with them. Internally, they look like this, where you have one of the balloons try to tamponade right at the uh, esophageal stomach uh, border, uh, one in the esophagus, one in the stomach. 
in an attempt to try to inflate it as much as possible to slow down the bleeding. Um, these are very uncomfortable uh, for patients. They are a last ditch heroic effort. The vast majority of patients will need to be intubated uh, and, and, and sedated and put to sleep before one of these tubes put out um, are put in. And uh, these are, are often patients who are absolutely critically ill, have vomited large amount of blood, are getting IV fluids and blood. Um, and uh, I wanted to make you aware of these tubes, although my suspicion is none of you will ever see uh, a Blakemore or a Minnesota Viracil tube uh, placed. But I wanted to at least make sure that you are uh, made aware of them. Uh, obviously, uh, if an NG tube is down, you're wanna, gonna wanna do lots of suction to get that blood out. Um, I would strongly recommend intubating the patient before transporting if they have one of these in. Um, and then certainly a big concern would be that you inflate the balloon so much that the esophagus gets so dilated that you're actually um, pushing on the airway um, and that they would actually have problems ble uh, breathing with these tubes in. If they have any problems uh, breathing at all, you're gonna want to try to deflate the balloons. Unfortunately, that may make the bleeding worse. Um, in that uh, regards, you're going to want to make sure that these uh, balloons stay uh, tied and that they don't wiggle loose in any which way. Um, and uh, these can be a very uh, a challenging transports with these major uh, bleeding patients. Uh, the next uh, bag that I want to talk about is an ostomy bag. I'm sure most of you are very familiar um, with these. These are attached to the surface of the abdomen after the intestines get uh, are resected. The patient doesn't have bowel movements. The uh, stool, the, the fecal material actually goes into the bag um, with it. And uh, because of this, um, having bowel movements or defecation is not controlled because you don't have your rectal sphincters like you're used to. Um, I talk to paramedics quite a bit about these ostomies and I tell them it's important to know where the ostomy is, again, in the GI system. Is it a, uh, a colostomy where it's the large intestine that's connected? Is it an ileostomy where the small bowel is in test, uh, in a, uh, a collected? And you want to know because it will make a difference for us what is wrong with the patient. You can empty these before transport. Many patients know how to empty these themselves. You want to look at the tube, what's coming out? Is it stool? Is it blood? has any of the intestines, instead of being at the, the, the abdominal wall, has it actually fallen into the bag? Um, is the uh, intestines that you can see, are they pink or have they turned black uh, or ischemic at all? Um, is the bag uh, nicely attached? The uh, surgical creation uh, of the ostomy is called the stoma with it, and it can be the small intestine or the large intestine with it. Um, it is not painful to touch. Um, it can wiggle or, or have peristalsis with it. Like the picture on the left here, some of it can actually be sticking out of the skin. That doesn't worry us. Sometimes several inches can come out of the skin. It would need to be uh, placed back in by a surgeon or an ER doctor. But you want to look at that intestine before you transport. Does it look pink and normal? Or does it look very red, beet red, like there's an infection there? Does it look black like the blood supply has been cut off? So you not only want to look at what is coming out of the ostomy, but you want to get your pen light and you want to try to examine what the intestine looks like in the stoma or the ostomy. Emptying a, an ostomy pouch is something that you may need to do if you have a long transport. You don't really want to be doing this in route. The uh, fecal material is often very smelly. It's very disgusting. The last thing you want to do is get halfway on a long transport and realize um, that you need to empty their ostomy bag. It is much better doing at the home, at the nursing home, before transport with it. Patients or, or staff at the, the facility should be able to assist you in doing it. I do want to mention it here uh, just in case uh, this ever comes up. But at the very end, away from the stoma, is often a clamp. You can undo the clamp and just use gravity to help drain out the bag. Very often, the same bag can be used. You don't need to replace the entire bag with it. All you need to do is um, reclamp uh, the ostomy, and then you can throw the uh, stool down a, a toilet with it. The biggest thing being make sure that your clamp is on securely. 
um, that any rolling that needs to be done uh, has been completed um, because the last thing you want is for this to leak the entire way uh, in uh, on the transport. The other very common catheter that either you will place in your career or that you will see is it what we call a Foley catheter or a urinary catheter. There are two different kinds. There are what we call straight catheters, which uh, patients or uh, staff will put in, drain the urine, and pull right back out, otherwise called a temporary or in and out catheter. Or there are indwelling or chronic uh, Foley catheters, which I'm sure almost all of you have ever seen um, before. These can become quite complicated. They're a frequent ER visit for us. They can become clogged either uh, with an infection or if uh, they're bleeding, you can have a little blood clot. You can get UTIs or infection. They can leak around the vulva or the penis, or they can become dislodged or pulled out um, with them. We really want to make sure that the patients don't pull them out. There is a balloon that gets blown up into the bladder, and so pulling on the balloon can either rupture the bladder open or in a worst case scenario, the patients can uh, tear their urethra um, by pulling these balloons out. Quite a painful and bleeding uh, event with it. I'll mention again how to place these. Again, I suspect that this is something that you would rarely do in your career, but it is something that I want to make you aware of how to do. It is a sterile procedure. You do not use regular gloves um, for these, but you want to make sure that you insert the catheter um, all the way in until you see urine flowing uh, from it. You want to blow up the uh, balloon that goes into the bladder, and you want to lightly pull back on the catheter uh, until you uh, reach some small resistance. You want to make sure that the catheter is obviously hooked up to the bag uh, and that it is flowing nicely. Same uh, procedure with the male. In fact, many people argue putting a catheter in a male is much easier than a uh, female. Um, the complication with a male is that the prostate uh, can often add some resistance and can make it challenging to get all the way to the uh, bladder. There are special uh, catheters that we use called a coude uh, catheter if there were ever any uh, problems getting past the uh, prostate. I'll mention these. These are rectal tubes. They are temporary. They're often used for patients who are having uh, profound diarrhea and are in a bed-bound state. They are, as uh, you imagine, they're a tube that goes up the rectum with the goal to ultimately uh, collect all the diarrhea that is occurring. And these are certainly just temporary uh, in nature, uh, nothing that we would keep uh, permanent. If the patient needed something permanent, we would move towards more of an ostomy bag. Uh, rectal tubes do come out uh, relatively easily, and so you want to make sure as a critical care paramedic they are secured, that they are well in place, any balloons are well inflated, and you want to make sure that any sort of bleeding uh, is identified. There's a couple of different surgical uh, drainage systems that I want to make you uh, folks aware of. There's what we call a Penrose drain. They look like little pieces of plastic. They often look like they would be uh, part of a Foley catheter uh, that is uh, cut. Um, they are, can be flat, and they are often sewn into a surgical wound either to keep infection like pus or blood out of the wound. Um, they are open on one side, and so the, the blood or the pus will often just drain right out from them. Therefore, some 4 by 4s or some gauze around them um, would be very uh, a good idea. They are often stitched in there. They don't come out. Uh, we often stitch those into place, but I want to make you aware of them so that you know what a Penrose drain looks like. A little bit more formal than a Penrose drain is what we call a JP drain or a Jackson Pratt drain. Uh, they're often called grenade uh, drains as well. The interesting thing about these is these are often to collect blood in a surgical. You can place them anywhere. They're very common after breast surgeries, neck surgeries, abdominal surgeries. There's often more than one. I've seen up to five or six of them placed in big surgeries. Uh, the thing about them is, is that they're under suction. And so if the grenade is fully blown up or looks like a grenade, they need to be opened and they need to be emptied. But for the suction to actually be activated, you have to squeeze them so that they are, are um, flattened. And then you, you close them for the suction to actually work, that they will not work if they are just kept in the grenade fashion. A hemovac drain looks similar. They're a little more rigid than a Jackson Pratt drain. They will be the same thing. They will be held into place by a stitch, and they will slowly drain the blood. They are a little harder 
than the usual, but they are drained by the same exact way. They must be flattened in order for the suction to work. They, look, they work exactly similar to a JP drain, um, but they are circular instead of grenade. Peritoneal dialysis is very common. Uh, we see these uh, patients often able to manage at home all by themselves. Unlike patients who have uh, a fistula in their arm or leg, peritoneal dialysis is done in the abdomen, often the lower abdomen. Peritoneal dialysis is uh, often done at night while the patient sleeps. They're often able to manage it all by themselves. Unfortunately, because people do it all by themselves, uh, these drains can get infected and their abdomen can get infected, a so-called peritonitis. These patients are actually often smart enough that they can give themselves IV antibiotics at home through the drain when they start to get infected. Unfortunately, these catheters can fall out. The infections can get quite severe. Um, and they can be uh, called for transport in. Any newly placed catheter is at risk for bleeding, so please make sure that they're properly secured, that the patient or yourself doesn't accidentally pull them out uh, while being transferred. And please note that these catheters often go very deep, even into the retroperitoneal uh, area or the pelvic area uh, of the abdomen. Um, and so you want to be very cautious with removing them because there could be up to a foot even more of the catheter actually into the uh, patient. A general checklist for all these tubes uh, certainly needs to be considered by a critical care paramedic. You want to know what's their purpose, what fluid is coming out of them, is it properly secured, has it been emptied, what are the potential complications uh, that can uh, arise from these tubes so that you sound knowledgeable and that you're up to date uh, on what these uh, lines are for these patients uh, when they are uh, taken into the hospital. That's my last slide. Uh, for this. This has been a, a long lecture. There's a lot of information in it. It's uh, exhausting uh, not only to lecture about but to hear. Uh, there's a lot of anatomy. There's a lot of physiology to take in. I did not read every slide verbatim. Please make sure you're reading the book, referencing the slides to make sure that you are aware of all the information. Um, this is not an exhaustive anatomy and physiology lecture, um, nor is it a pathophysiology lecture. There's a lot that can go wrong in the GI and GU tracks. I've tried to cover the most important uh, pathologies that can occur. I've tried to cover what we use as physicians to try to uh, alleviate these pathologies, talking about endoscopies, the various tubes that we use, uh, how we deal with uh, all these different pathologies. Please ask questions, share experiences, discuss what you have done during these transport to make them as easy as possible um, with it. Uh, it takes quite a lot of time to wrap your head around uh, this chapter. There's a lot of information, and so please make sure that you are revisiting it uh, over and over again as one time through this material uh, is not going to be uh, sufficient. Um, and uh, please make sure that you're looking at the diagrams, trying to get a visual of how all these different diseases, the anatomy flows together. Make sure that you understand when something goes wrong with a patient, that you are understanding why it is going wrong and what are the potential complications uh, that can uh, occur in route. Um, but I'll leave it at that and make sure um, that you're asking questions and understanding the material. Thank you for your time.